one and a two and a three. Hey, thanks for listening to the Welding Tips and Tricks podcast. I'm Jody Collier, and I'm here with Roy Crumrine. How's it going? And Jonathan Lewis. Howdy, everyone. You know, every podcast we have a topic, and then every other podcast will usually interview a guest. And uh, the last topic we had was about purging or purge welding, about how to get a how to get a purge. When do you need a purge? You know, when can you get get by without a purge and maybe use backing instead? And that kind of led us into thinking that we would talk about troubleshooting this time, not only about purging, but just about everything. Like what happens, you know, you're, you're welding along on some carbon steel and you start getting porosity and you just you chase it. It won't go away or or you're welding with your MIG welder. and You just can't get a you can't get a stable arc, et cetera, et cetera. It, it can go on and on. So things do go wrong. And uh, you have to stop and sort of put on your troubleshooting hat for a minute. And that's what we thought we'd talk about today. Sounds um, good. Since last topic was purge welding or purging, um, we might as well start with that. You know, let's talk about what do you do? Let's say you're purging. In my mind's eye, I'm thinking about pipe joint, 24-inch stainless pipe about 20 foot long. And I'm welding a 90 elbow onto a 20-foot stick of 24 inch stainless pipe doesn't really matter what thickness okay i've got a big pipe cap taped on one end um i got another pipe cap may or maybe just a whatever cardboard or whatever taped on the other end with a piece of plexiglass taped on there where i can see the root i'm testing it with a purge meter and i just can't get it to go and i even light up on it with a root and run just a little bit and it doesn't look good it's looking really dark all right what's the first thing that you start checking on when you're when you're dealing with you we can't get a purge like that anyone anyone <laughs> <laughs> is this a bait <laughs> no bait it's not I, I i didn't even think about it i just pulled that one out of my rectal database there real quick <laughs> but you know um it's not a bait question it's like i'll tell you I'll, I'll go ahead and start the conversation where i would be thinking okay do i just think i have all the orifices taped off like is there a drip leg vent line is there a this you know is that i forgot to tape off um is there something dumb that i forgot you know like it, i didn't seal it up or uh right where the argon hose goes in maybe that's not even sealed up and it's sucking air in and drawing air in there or something like that that would be kind of where to start but then again you kind of it depends on where you're at and what you're doing you kind of have to start thinking about well did we just change cylinders of argon you know could that be it I mean, we we were getting a good purge on that last cylinder of argon, and we changed. You know what I'm saying? Right, what, right. what changed? What you know? What happened? Uh, and and that's what you that's kind of what you start thinking about when you start thinking about troubleshooting. I think like what what happened? What changed? Why was it doing good a minute ago, and or last time I did this, and why is it not doing good this time? I think I'd go that direction too, honestly. Think why what I do wrong and first thing that popped in my head as you were talking about that was is the gas good? Second thing the gas from the parent bottle. Second thing would be cleanliness of the pipe itself. You know, I would assume that that would be checked before you taped it up and welded it up, but you know, again, you know, that as we talked about last time, you can get into the very high end or very detailed parts of purging. You know, was there oil inside? Um, like you said, was there a cavity that didn't get filled out? Can we roll this to kind of move the uh, atmosphere around in there? You know, there's just tons of different things I would think of. What kind of tape are you using? Holes, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I said a stick of pipe, but it could be a spool assembly where there's a, a drip leg welded onto it or some other stem or OLED or whatever. And maybe that thing is sitting sitting there on the bottom with a half inch of water in it. Yeah. You know, and if you get it, you put a drop of water inside of inside something you're trying to purge and you might get a good enough purge for stainless steel, but you're not going to, you're not going to get down into those, you know, just a few parts per million if you got water inside what you're purging. So that happens sometimes, you know, you get, a, you get a, a little puddle of water. I've even seen it where, gosh, we had a, a floodlight inside the pipe before and um, if I'm, I'm, if I remember right, um, somebody forgot to hook up the ground, and so we were grounding through the, the uh, circuit of the floodlight, you know, mm. just a, and and so it was just smoking up the whole inside of the pipe because it was melting the rubber on the wiring, the insulation on the <laughs> wiring, and everything. <laughs> and of course, we weren't getting a good purge because we couldn't see anything either, you know, because it was all smoky. 
And they were like, oh, crap, hook the ground back up. You know, we had to untape everything, pull everything uh, <laughs> out of there. Yes. I know, but, you know, we're thinking we were doing a smart thing, having a flood, a lamp in there so we could see the root real well. <laughs> and, it, mm. and it wound up being, you know, total pooch screw. <laughs> yeah. It's a good theory. Yeah, that's good. It was a good try. It didn't really hurt anything. It didn't, didn't contaminate or anything, but, you know, we had to, we really did have to kind of start over, retape, make sure we had a ground on it. And I forget exactly how that came out, but. I'm sure the hmm, floodlight didn't. It probably didn't fare too well. But there were thousands of them on, you know, on a, on a big job. You know, it, the old saying, you'll have that on those big jobs. <laughs> yeah. But they were literally, you know, it's like you couldn't, you couldn't walk without tripping over a little pigtail on a floodlight. Uh, bowl because everything when you're working on a power plant it's always a struggle to get good lighting wherever you're working and so those were just like there were maybe not thousands but definitely hundreds of them laying around hmm. you know so that's that's a purge example um one, I'll, I'll bring up another i'll bring up another one a purge example is on a titanium part and this brings up the water issue because we were using a water cooled torch and couldn't get a purge inside the chamber. And you know, you know, some some um, TIG torches have the nice threaded connections with no little wire ties or anything. But some of the older school ones had this the little almost like stainless safety wire that would just twist it around the um, all the water lines. And we were getting a little leak there, a little drop or two, about two drops of coolant or water or whatever it was, and couldn't get a purge on the for titanium that way. So that's just a Good example of uh, we we had to start looking and taking crap apart and stuff to to find out why we couldn't get a purge. It's always frustrating when you're chasing a purge. I mean, especially on something big that you've spent a lot of time purging out and then you can't get it down. It's like, what's going on here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, my first place I usually look if I know everything is taped off right or plugged up right. You know, I'll really inspect the hose that's coming through because a lot of time your purge hose flopping around on their bench or you know rolled up for a good while and then you unroll it and might be cracked a little bit just from almost dry rot if you haven't used it for a long time but i've seen a lot of them where you know, they've touched hot parts and everything and they'll get a little tiny melt spot on it bending back and forth and back and forth will finally wear through you know and that's usually where i've run into problems and i'll cut the hose off right past that stick it in there and it purges right out just fine. Mhm. And you but you have to start you have to start the thinking process, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You know like what the heck's going on here, you know? And uh that brings to mind another issue like occasionally um one job that I was working on, you'd be you'd be, you know, you'd light up on a part and then you wouldn't have any you wouldn't have any arc. No arc. Okay. What's going on? Do I need to call equipment maintenance here to come look at my machine or what's going on. And the deal was more often than not, we were running, instead of recirculating glycol or coolant or whatever, we were running tap water through the torches and just drain, it would just drain, you know. Right. Of course, city tap water, you know, just loaded with all kind of minerals and chlorine and everything. There's like a point about six inches or eight inches or a foot from the torch handle where it got the most flex from you just, you know, using it. And that would finally just corrode and wouldn't make a connection again. And you could actually feel it. You know, you start pinching and stuff. And that's another example of troubleshooting. You know, it's kind of like you want to, you kind of sometimes want to, you know, if you work at a uh, company where you have somebody to call, if you have a problem and they come and troubleshoot, the, like a electrician comes and troubleshoots your machine or whatever, you don't want to be looking like a dummy if like all it is is a corroded uh, torch yeah. line. Yeah. 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 I worked at one place, they had really old foot pedals, and so of course, obviously, they had the cord to them, and they were breaking all the time, I don't know, don't know why, I've never worked anywhere that we went through so many foot pedal cords, but this might seem pretty obvious to some people, but I learned it there and was like, huh, that makes sense, was, you know, if you're welding along and kick your foot pedal across the floor, and all of a sudden it doesn't, it's not working anymore, if you take the cord and you... Just kind of bend it with like a big loop in your hand and just keep working down the line and just keep bending it and bending it. You'll see where it kinks and that's where the break is at in the line itself. It's like, oh, that's kind of a neat little trick. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That works. You know, yeah, nothing lasts forever. And gosh, you know, I, when I went to work at the airline, 
I mean, there were machines that had been there for 20 and 30 years, and the same foot pedal probably been on them for that long, you know? Mm -hmm. In fact, they were just upgrading from these old three-phase NCG machines. They were, I think, if I'm not mistaken, NCG was bought out by Miller or ITW or whatever, but they were big old yellow three-phase machines, some of them strictly DC, some of them AC, DC, but they were just old. I mean, like they were tanks, though, you know, I mean, they had huge transformers in them and and they were fine. But, man, that stuff looked like primitive. You know, the foot pedal must have weighed 30 pounds, you know. And, <laughs> yeah. And and nothing had ever been maintained or, tr or, or you know, really like new foot upgraded with new foot pedals or anything. So I'm sure a lot of that you could see the cord on the foot pedal. A lot of them were just dry rotted, you know. Yeah. And drug across the floor, had little metal slivers in them and. Every, eventually, something's used enough, it's going to mess up. That's just the way of it. If you're the unlucky sucker that happens to have the torch in your hand when it does mess up, you know, that's when you start, you got to start doing a little thinking and troubleshooting, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and start thinking, well, what, 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 what could this be? And then, you know, it's not a bad, it, not a bad thing. It's just kind of like we all have to go through it from time to time. And so it makes for good conversation here on, on the podcast, you know? Yeah. But you, you mentioned, you know, bringing or calling over your maintenance. And, you know, mm -hmm. to try to help you do your welder. I've met a friend out about in town, and uh, he was telling me about about some of the things that were going on in his place. He works. Well, a lot of the guys, and it was frustrating to him, be frustrating to me too. You know, they have any little problem, they immediately call in. They they have you know the, for the welders and for whatever they do. Uh, a lot of times it's because they don't want to figure it out and they just want to waste time working. And that was his frustration talking about that. But, you know, him, he wants to figure it out. If something goes wrong, he runs a robot. Uh, so it's, you know, I guess it has its own challenges in figuring out what's wrong. But I wouldn't want to be that, you know, that person. I know there's a lot of people out there that would probably waste that time. But it just brought that to mind, you know, how there is a lot of people out there that probably don't want to, for whatever reason, to learn. But me, I mean, if I can figure it out for this time, you know, I, I know how to fix it for next time, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, any company that has, like, say, more than five welding stations would do real well, not only to have the same welding machine in every booth, just for the economics of standardization. You know, like, say, you got a mm -hmm. Dynasty 350 in every booth. They'd do really well to have an extra, at least one extra foot pedal, <laughs> you know, all, all right, the time. Right. You know, that's just a, that. Ports. Yeah, that's the thing that kind of gets used most, you know, the foot pedal. And I've seen a bunch of times – where we had to stop what's going on because you you know you, you'd, you'd light up with a foot pedal and then then it's fine but then there was a space in between no pedal and full pedal that was just like wasn't responsive at all like it didn't seem to do anything and there's a component in most foot pedals you know a little kind of a resistor coil or something that something the little contactor runs up and down and that was a real common failure point in the foot pedals and you know i mean but why I have a welder waste time changing that out. Just have a spare foot pedal and have somebody else be rebuilt, rebuild the foot pedal, you know, when, when there's time and when you're not worried about getting a part done that needs to go on a, on an engine or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But there, there's always common things that are failure points and, you know, you figure a few of those out along the way in the workplace, you know, there's so much activity, so many hours put on certain, <laughs> certain things and you figure things out after a while. Yeah. So, seems how we're talking about TIG welding with foot pedals, let's say you're welding aluminum and you're getting a bunch of black speckles in your weld. Where would you start at with troubleshooting that? I probably would start with the gas. Um, that would be my, that just like low hanging fruit. Like, did we just change gas? You know, that would be a question that I would have. Like, um, aside from that, I would be looking at other gas related issues like um is my torch leaking can I, is my tungsten silver you know I'd be looking at gas that's just the quickest thing there can be breakdown I have seen anyway breakdowns in in the uh, circuitry of the of the welder where it's not you know providing enough cleaning action and and is causing that but a lot of times I have seen it, it, some gas related issue and, and like I said it could be a bad tank of gas it could be a leaking connection it could be a pinhole in your gas line of your torch. It could even be a, a bad gas lens uh, collet body. Mm -hmm. Those are those are my thoughts initially. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That, Same here. That's usually my general rule of thumb is I go from the torch back to the machine 
And, mm-hmm. you know, un- unless I know for a fact that I just changed the tank gas or something and then it's acting goofy. But if it was acting totally fine, then all of a sudden starts acting weird for no reason. You know, I look at my cup, look at, see if my collet's twisted or change the collet out first thing that, you know, those don't cost that much. So I just throw one away and put another one in. And uh, if everything still is going crazy, I mean, I've had it where there was just a little nick in the gasket on the back cap and it was sucking air through the back cap and changed the little gasket o-ring out welded just fine after that i was like huh that's weird and that's something it's just that's that's the way it is and then a lot of times too you know it'll it'll start welding kind of funky and it's like well what's going on then if you change the cup and everything cleans up and it's going good it's like well what happened it's like, well, you remember about two days ago when you dropped the torch and you picked it back up and you looked at it like, ooh, man, it didn't break. Cool. Man, probably put a little micro fracture in there. And then with the different heat cycles, it went through welding. It finally worked its way all the way through. And then it's sucking air through the cup, through that little crack. You know, and then that's sometimes that's all it takes. Yeah. And cups are almost like disposable razors you know i mean if one of them's starting to you know cut you and drag you throw that son of a gun away and grab another one you know mm-hmm. um they're, they're not that expensive and that that can happen I, i've seen there's so many things that can happen and so much that i have learned especially now that i sell some tor- torch components you know when i learned about tolerances of torches the tolerances of everything in torches is only somewhere around 10 or 15 thousandths of an inch of tolerance well you can have easily accumulation of tolerance where the the o-ring in the back cap doesn't seat and everything could be intolerance but it's accumulation if that o-ring in the back cap doesn't seat guess what (laughs) you're sucking a little air you know and and on some metals you may not even notice it but some you will so you got to really start thinking about when something goes wrong like Roy just said, you get you start getting a little pepper in the puddle, little black specks in your aluminum weld. Well, generally that can be from not enough cleaning action, but it can definitely be from not quite perfect shielding, also, or a combination of the two. So the easy thing to check, because it's hard to it's hard to troubleshoot circuitry inside your welder. The easy thing to check is the is the gas shielding and. Why is it not getting gas shielding? So, you know, is, is it sucking air from somewhere, you know, and start looking at things like that. Look at the O-ring on the back cap and see, is it engaging? Is it seating? You know, look at your cup real closely. Look at the argon hose of the torch, you know, get out this little snoop soap, soapy water bottle and start checking connections and see if they're blowing bubbles, you know, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I've had that, you know, my dual flow regulator developed a leak on the one side and every time I would use it for anything, it would give me nasty looking welds. And I was like, what's going on? Finally figured it out that, you know, by spraying soapy water and everything on it, that it was leaking. So I tore it apart and redid it, tightened it all back up and it's peachy. So now every once in a while, I will put the soapy water on that and my connections just to make absolutely sure that there's no leak on them. Yeah. And there's no guarantee either. You know, when you buy the, the regulators, I mean, even though they aren't tested, I still wouldn't, you know, be, be too proud to, to test them yourself because you just you just never know. Oh, yeah. It is a good idea for the for the you know three minutes that it takes you to do that. It, it, it's worth some peace of mind, definitely. So another scenario for you along the same line anyway. So let's say you come up to my TIG welder after I got done welding, and this is more for the beginners because I saw this in at a, a, a class I helped with uh, this week. That of course you know they don't they don't know what it is that they're seeing. But let's say you come up to my TIG welder. I've been welding for a while. You light up, and the first thing you notice is the arc cone or the plume around that is green. And after you get done welding, you realize that it's all like a golden brown all around the weld. And again, this is more for the beginners that that don't haven't seen this. What would be the problem with that? And again, we're talking troubleshooting, trying to figure out what's wrong with that. Contaminated tungsten. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go there myself. Whenever you see that brown orange, look, almost looks like it's been plated <laughs> with orange or whatever, that's usually contaminated tungsten. That's metal outgassing. That tungsten gets so hot, you know, it gets, I mean, melting point of tungsten is over 6,000 Fahrenheit. So that's well above the melting point of anything you're welding. So if you get one little blob of steel on your tungsten, 
it actually gets hot enough to vaporize and it's sort of like almost plates onto your onto your weld you know and that gives you that brown orange hue and uh it's usually giving you a little halo or hue off the electrode too, but a beginner may not notice that. Mm-hmm. So something to really pay attention to. I'll shut up now. I think I've hogged the conversation. <laughs> well, Go ahead, Roy. Uh, I don't think you were finished with your thoughts there. Well, no, I was going to say the same thing. That's a telltale sign. If you see an orange soot, it's your contaminated tungsten. And then to continue that a little bit, if you see a blue soot on there and you have a water-cooled torch... Most of the time, that means you've got a leak in your torch neck of the head, and you're leaking a little bit of water in there. And eventually, within that day, it's going to start leaking out, and it's going to get really bad really quick. <laughs> really bad really quick. Hashtag really bad really quick. <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, yeah. You, if you see it, just a little haze of a blue soot, it's a really light blue. It's like, what is that? And then about an hour later, it's like, Man, there's water dripping out of my cup. It's like, yeah, uh, goes back yeah, to that, that, you know, maintenance thing of you know, it. It it pays if you if you're running your own business on your in your garage or, you know, just whatever. It it it's well worth it to go buy an extra foot pedal and go buy an extra torch. You know, just have them sitting there in in the closet inside or something because it's gonna break on a Sunday. You're not going to be able to yeah. finish anything. Always, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. But you just you two, just promised on your mother's you know tombstone that you'd be, deliver deliver the product on Monday morning, and it's going to break on a Sunday, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's worth its weight in gold just having it sit there. Here's another one. Then, what about you're welding along, and at some point in time, you realize things aren't going too good. And again, a beginner may not notice it under the hood, but you lift up your hood and there's yellow powder there left behind. And you can look at your tungsten, you can see that it's, you know, burnt, fried, whatever. What would be the yellow powder? Yeah. I don't know. So <laughs> <laughs> I had it happen to me and I still, I still, I have a suspicion on what it was. I took a picture of it, meaning to share it. But I was welding with a large jumbo gas lens, and I mean I was running into all kinds of problems. And every once, well, actually every time I stopped, it would blow up yellow um, powder, like soot, pow- not soot, but like a powder. And my guess was that I either had something contaminated in the base metal or something, but the tungsten was turning dark, uh, even though my post flow was, you know, set. I mean it's a diversion, so. It's factory preset. Uh, my guess was that you know it still wasn't enough or wasn't enough shielding coverage. Shielding coverage is what I guessed that it was, but I'd never seen yellow before. Well, when at first when you said that, I'm, I was searching my memory banks, you know, for yellow. What? And then you know when you when you blow a breaker, when you're welding aluminum and you blow a breaker, and you, all of a sudden you got no coverage. You know, sometimes you'll get that yellow, and your tungsten is just roached. You know, black. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have had, I have seen it before also on using a pretty good size cup, like a number 15 cup and welding along stainless and everything's going good. And all of a sudden, poof, there's no wind or anything in the shop. And I never did. I, I never did dial it in, but when I'm thinking about it, I thought about it a lot since then. I wondered if it could have been, I've read a little bit about the long, the long end caps. Sometimes they can trap air in them. Oh, really? And then at the worst possible time, of course, it you know it it shows itself. I don't know if that's the hmm. case, but um, uh, it seemed to it seemed to pop its head up. And I won't say what brand. You know, it doesn't really. I mean, maybe it matters, maybe it don't. Of cup that I was using, and not my particularly favorite cup, but I figured, well, I'm going to give it a shot. And finally, I just switched back to my tried and true jumbo gas lens number twelve, and the problem went away instantly. So I was like, huh, must not have been something. Something wasn't right. And uh, mm, yeah. tried a few things, and it did go away once I shortened up, or it seemed to go away when I shortened the tungsten up, you know, really close to the edge of the cup instead of having a three quarter inch stick out or whatever. Anyway, since we were talking about powders and yeah, you know, man, soots and stuff, I, I w- I've been meaning to ask that. Actually, at some point in time, I want to post it on Instagram and see what other people have to say about it. I've seen a yellow soot when I was welding thicker aluminum and I had too much helium in the mix. I don't know if it was burning too hot or something and that 
it had a, a yellow ashy soot to it. Hmm. This was DC welding up a shaft. I mean, it was carbon steel. I believe it was carbon steel anyway. A shaft. Were and, you uh, using a long back cap? Do you remember? Probably. Yeah, I think there's maybe something, and I actually think it was something I read on um, the on Arc Zone's site about that, about how that's a possibility. Like it's not a given, but it's a possibility. You know. Well, wouldn't that? Uh, well, I mean, thinking thinking out loud here, wouldn't that? suck the atmosphere out when you had your pre-flow you would think you would think I, i'm just trying to you know because like i say i had it happen to me and i never did i never did uh, really find root cause because i was had to had to get finished with what i was doing and so i you know my main goal was to get the part out it wasn't to fi- figure out what was going wrong because right. i i just changed some stuff up and it worked and i kept going you know but i i kept wondering about what the hell happened there you know Everything was going great, and everything was a perfect gas shielding, and then you know went went south quick. So mm-hmm. I don't know. It it just uh, there's probably a way to like purge that out, like manipulate the handle of the torch as you're you know like bump the pedal, move things around, do whatever you know before you start welding. Probably takes care of that issue, but I don't I don't know that it's an issue because I mean I've used those long back caps a lot in training classes because you don't want to you don't want to waste tungsten so you, you get a new pack of tungsten you don't want to cut them all up if you don't have to because you're just in a booth right, right? yeah so yeah right. it's just just efficient to just use the long cap and then as you know you only use the short ones when you're confined spaces and you need to you know mm-hmm. um, yeah so i never had that issue in in a training class but um but i had it in my garage <laughs> you know it's so. probably a rare I don't know. You would think it'd be a rare thing. I mean, that's why we tell everybody to set your preflow for at least two tenths. You know, that way you can purge out your line before your arc initiates. Mm-hmm. Um, I could see, I could see that then. But that's interesting. Learn something. Well, yeah. I mean, just interesting. Like, if you want to eliminate all possibilities of things going wrong like that, maybe, just maybe. I don't even. I'm not saying it's true, but maybe you don't want to use a long back cap if you just want to eliminate those type of scenarios. You know, maybe you just use a little stubby back cap and or maybe even just a button. I don't know. You just want to totally eliminate the possibility of something like that happening. I don't know. I don't really understand. Well, I do kind of understand. If you think about purge and, you know, the talking about argon being heavier than air and and all that, if you hold if you hold the cup like you're going to weld something, that back cap is just sticking straight up in the air. How does it get how does it get purged out? You know? Yeah, because, I mean, as soon as you let off, the atmosphere mitigates back into your solenoid, you know, so. I guess we gotta invent a, we got to invent a back cap with a check valve now. <laughs> That's right. A torch with a back cap, something. Yeah. yeah. Or a torch something with like a that. valve, something like that. <clears throat> yeah. It's, I think it's a rare, it's a rare thing, but I think maybe it's one of those things that it can happen. So if, if what you're welding can't tolerate the possibility of that happening, you know, maybe it is smart to not use a long back cap on something like that. Mm-hmm. Just a thought. I've heard of people actually pre-purging their lines or whatever you want to call it for, you know, a minute, two minutes, whatever the time actually was before they start welding, um, you know, like a, a very critical part, you know, set their hot, you know, however they do it. Uh, I'm not really sure. It depends on your machine, really, where they would let the gas flow, make sure it's all pure. And then, you know, the arc would initiate. For a good amount, I'm talking about a good amount of time, not just like two tenths or two seconds or something, like a minute or two, because mm-hmm. of the the fear of contamination from the atmosphere that mitigated back into your torch. Yeah, so, you know, it just depend. It does depend on what you're welding. Like if you're welding, you know, uh, molybdenum or something, and it's you know six thousand dollars an ounce, and the part costs twelve thousand dollars, and you know, you 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 don't care if you have to pre-purge for 30 seconds you know right it doesn't matter the the part but if you're if you're just if you're just doing run-of-the-mill carbon steel stuff you know who cares you just you don't even want to waste a second you know if you have to if it's your gas that you're paying for so Mm -hmm. it all it really does all all depend but um i could see like if you think about it if you think about when you 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 terminate an arc you know there is no check valve so you terminate an arc you hang your torch on a little torch holder whatnot what keeps our uh, atmosphere from getting into the torch body and the torch lines? And say you go for lunch and you come back, you know, an hour later, 
30 minutes later, whatever, probably would be wise to let it per, a pre-purge run for 30 seconds or so, you know? Right. Yeah, Again, actually, it all depends I, on what you're welding. Yeah. Go on. But just the point of interest, I was talking to some people about, uh, you know, high purity welding and high purity, you know, from your tanks to your regulators, your lines, all that stuff, up to your solenoid into your machine. And for those that don't know, a lot of high purity welding that goes on out there, they actually change out the solenoid and the, and the lines inside the welders um, so that they are stainless usually and a high purity, you know, valve inside of there. But I've always asked, so you spent all that time and money up until the welder, what about your torch? And mm-hmm. no one's been able to really answer that point because it's like, you know, do you, what do you do to clean your torch out to make absolutely sure that that 15, 20 feet, whatever you got is, you know, a pure line inside of it also. But anyways, that's way beyond what we're talking about. Just, just something of interest. Well, you know, in the last, in the last, uh, podcast when we talked about purging the topic came up about using plastic fittings plastic wise um and how they could outgas and Mm -hmm. and 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 there is there is a difference between stainless or brass or aluminum and all that you know the aluminum gets oxidized on the surface and so you're the theory is you're going to get more parts per million off of a aluminum tubing or aluminum fitting or aluminum backup fixture than you will off stainless because just the layer of oxidation on aluminum is going to contain some oxygen and hydrogen and stuff, you know, and that's true. It is true. But, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's important when you're doing titanium or tantalum or molybdenum or something, it's not necessarily a deal killer when you're welding 300 series stainless, you know, right. you have to really, but, but the topic came up in, in the airline industry about purge lines, you know, because we were running, everybody was just running automotive vacuum, vacuum line. That was just like every, in everybody's booth, they had automotive vacuum line, and a lot of times it would be they'd have this little valve, like, and you know, have twelve foot of line, a little valve that would just stay off, and they'd hook the line up to a backup box, reach over here, turn the valve on, boom, they're purging, whatever. But you know, you start reading, and different rubbers have different like pores, and and you know, you can't you can't really get a perfect low parts per million argon atmosphere with a porous rubber tubing. So they recommended other other types of uh, I don't want to say plastic, but other types of tubing that were much less. I guess the surface was much less likely to outgas. In other words, you know. Mm-hmm. So we started yeah. getting into that a little bit. You know, we upgraded. We in, in the booths in the training center, we upgraded from the automotive vacuum line to the clear. I don't know if it was Tigon or I don't remember what it was, but it was advertised. It, it fit the bill, in other words, as far as what the specs were. And we didn't really see much difference in results or anything, but we're just trying to do the right thing, you know. Right. But it, those little things can make a difference. So if it only costs you a few bucks to make a change and eliminate the possibility, eliminate the variable, you know, that might bite you in the butt, definitely do that. That's part of troubleshooting is eliminating variables, right? <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. Exactly. That's the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. We're saying that. If you're really trying to figure out what's going on, change one thing, weld another bead. And if it's got the same thing, change another thing, weld a bead, change another thing, weld a bead. You know, I'm usually, you know, I'm, I don't really care. I just want to get it fixed. So I just change a whole bunch of things all at one time and then it works. And it's like, well, what was wrong? I don't know. It was one of those five things. So, <laughs> but you know, I mean, if you're really trying to, narrow it down to what's the culprit you know just just change one thing at a time but like i said most of the time you're not going to have time to sit there and mess around with one thing at a time well that is a wise piece of advice change only change one thing at a time especially applies when you are dialing in a welding procedure but like you said when you're troubleshooting your main goal isn't always to find the root cause it's just to you know fix the problem get things going good again so you can do produce parts, you know. So, but you, if you really want to know what the cause is, you, you really should just change one or try one thing at a time to to eliminate process of elimination and to figure out what it is that is going wrong. Right. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah. So many times when I get I get questions and emails and somebody's talking about something wrong and it's they just changed a bottle of gas. So many times, and you cannot depend just because the bottle says argon. You cannot, I'm sorry, I hate to offend anybody out there at welding supply stores and everything, but I've just, I've gotten too many emails. You can't depend that it is argon just because it says argon. You know, there are mistakes are made sometimes. 
And I'm, I've seen it several times, you know, where a guy, you know, he's just like, I got a new bottle and it's just bubbly, bubbly, bubbly. I light up and there's this porosity right away. You know, I've got an orange tint to the arc and I, it just can't, I just can't weld. And well, what did you do recently? Well, I just changed bottles of gas. Well, that's the first way to go. And I, I took it back to my welding supply and he swore there's no way it could be bad. Well, guess what? You know, I said, well, do you have a friend you can borrow a, borrow a bottle of argon from that, th- that they know works good? And they say, yeah, and then they do it and then everything's fine. And then they go back and ream the guy's, you know, butt at the counter. <laughs> but, you know, it, it happens. And I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. It's just one of those things that happens in industry. So if you just changed gas, you just change a cylinder of gas and things go awry, that's probably the first place to go. Even if it says argon, even if the bottle's all new and shiny, you know, that's the first place to look at. Yeah. Right. That actually reminded me uh, a couple weeks ago, one of my buddies texted me some pictures of some of his stuff he was doing, and he was saying he was tacking this little aluminum part, and the first tack was terrible. I mean, it, it was all just looked like it almost kind of like exploded right there. And, you know, and the second one was a little bit better, and the third one was fine. And I just asked him, I said, is it humid in your shop today? And he's like, yeah, it, it's really hot in here. And I said, preheat your part just a little bit because the, there's probably too much moisture in the part. And the reason why the third tack is going just fine is because it's gotten hot enough to burn off all the moisture in the part. So just hit it with a map gas torch really quick and get it up to a little bit of a temperature and try it again. And I texted him a couple of days after that. I said, did that help? And he's like, yep, that was it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, people don't realize that aluminum. You know that again. This topic can get broad too, but you know even your TIG fillers, your MIG wires, all that stuff. You know that all sucks. I mean, to just to put it like as easy as you can, it all sucks moisture in. So if you run into those problems, there that can be a, a problem. There are people out there that that don't believe that, um, but I, I've seen results with MIG welding. Where you one day it runs great, and I know all of us have seen this, or a lot of us have seen this. It runs great, you know, a couple of weeks later, next day, whatever, and it runs terrible. But yeah, I've I've seen that also, and on parts, I don't guess I've never really paid much attention to parts, but with the fillers, yeah, you know, we've had Nate Martin, the underwater welder, Diver Nate on Instagram, that's Diver in uh, number eight. Um, you know, he, he's done a lot of work on qualifying aluminum MIG welding, not underwater wet welding, but underwater where, where it's super humid in a um, habitat. And he, he talked a little bit about that, how difficult that was just to, with the mm-hmm. humidity, you know, and it's just like you've got to pay attention to every variable to make things go good there. And I've seen it in we, – we mentioned a little bit about thermal spray in one of the last podcasts – Thermal spray is very common operation in aircraft, and it's used in many industries, paper mill, like spray and hard coats on journals and things like that. You've seen like A-Bomb 79, it does a little flame spray on some videos, sometimes some hard surfacing using oxy fuel, and it feeds a powder into that fuel, you know. But anyway, if you can imagine spraying fine droplets from a powder into a flame and onto a part, imagine how humidity affects that. Mm. We used to test every day at the airline thermal spray tests. We'd have to qualify booths before they could spray parts. And humidity was a huge deal. A lot of times it was like the deal, you know. And uh, you could spray the same part one day and the next and not change a thing. And one day it would fail due to 87% humidity. And the next day the humidity went down to 40 and the same parameters would pass, you know. And uh, so it is a big deal in welding, too, absolutely, on, on uh, aluminum humidity pay attention like if anything you can do to reduce it like roy said preheat the part you know maybe even i mean maybe even preheat your filler metal to be honest you know wouldn't hurt like put if you could heat your filler metal up to you know even though it's tig and doesn't require being in an oven but if you can bake it a little bit or something that sometimes that stuff helps yeah i'm actually i hope not giving away a trade secret i don't think i am but there's a company that i know of that actually runs their own version of of some sort of heater to, for the MIG welding, uh, mainly dual shield flux core and aluminum, mm-hmm. and the wire runs through that heater. Hmm. And as it turns on, that they've got it figured out to where 
when you pull the trigger. Uh, however, I don't know how it actually all works. I think it's more proprietary than anything. That as you're welding, it supposedly heats up the filler as it passes through before it hits the w- drive rolls and gets rid of all moisture or most moisture before it gets to the uh, arc. Wow. Or, you know, the end, the end of the nozzle. Because of what they're doing is critical and whatnot. But it's funny, is when we got to that, it was like, yeah, why don't you guys do this? And they're like, well, we already do that. I'm like, oh, I didn't even know that was possible. It's just something that popped <laughs> into my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, you really? know, it's crazy. All the those little things sometimes that make all the difference. This has nothing to do with anything we're talking about, but I'll make it quick here. You know, at Delta, they had an electron beam welder, and that welds in a vacuum. So it was in a big chamber. And first, they had to get their part settled in the chamber, and they'd pump down to a vacuum before they could start welding. If they would use a um, a cardboard spool of wire in there, you know, they couldn't get it pumped down to a correct atmosphere for welding. They couldn't use those, you know. And, and that same thing, same concept applies to, like, using leather gloves in a argon chamber box. You know, they outgas, and you, you can't get a perfect purge that way. But yep. these little things, like you don't think about, oh yeah, it's just that's how wire comes. You know, they, they would have to get the spool of wire that came on a sort of a, a wire frame, you know, in order for uh, to pump down to a correct vacuum for electron beam welding. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, troubleshooting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who would have thunk? So we move on to MIG welding. Yeah, man. We covered, we covered, you know, at least some of TIG. You know, again, we've not really like went super super deep, but I know there's a lot of questions about MIG. Uh, more probably more than TIG. I don't know. If I say more than TIG, but there's a lot of questions on MIG, especially for those that you know are, are new to it. All the nuances of like the why is the wire spitting back at me? Uh, that's the first one I want to talk to because it's one of the main ones I hear about. You pull the trigger and it's just like pop, 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 pop. Sounds like a machine gun going off. That seems to be one of the, I guess, one of the more popular questions. So. I'll put Jody on the spot on this one. So what happens? You pull the trigger and it says pop, 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 and it won't light up. But it may, you know, may, either it won't light up at all and, and carry an arc, or you do that for a few seconds and eventually it'll catch on and then you got an arc. Why does that happen? Well, I camp out on this a lot, so thanks for serving this one up for me. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. That's, yeah, why I, I know. that's why I gave it to you. <laughs> Having a super good ground is more important probably on MIG than most other processes. You know, if you if you have a loose ground on TIG, well, you know, maybe you give it a little more foot pedal and, and everything settles in. But if you think about MIG, and this is really a simple explanation because there's all these synergic processes in MIG and smart machines that detect things in, in the arc and everything. But in a basic MIG machine, you know, you pull the trigger, wire starts coming out. And it melts into the puddle. Well, if you don't have a ground, the wire does not stop coming out. It's going to come out anyway, right? So if you just like slip your ground clamp over hot rolled mill scale, um, you light up and it sounds like a drive by shooting. And then finally it settles down because finally it arced out on the two, on the teeth of the uh, ground clamp and you finally got a ground and then it welds good. That's pretty typical. So therefore take a few seconds, get a grinder, shine that area you're going to put your ground up down to clean bright metal and get a good rigid ground connection and then usually you don't have that stutter drive by shooting effect <laughs> when you light up you know that's the first thing i think that's like do that above all things and and i swear 200 amp and below mig welders it seems like they it seems like welding companies are just they want to save that two and a half dollars on giving you a crappy ground clamp you know give you basically a, a dollar store jumper cable clamp instead of a decent ground clamp with some copper alloy in it, you know, but it is what it is. In fact, you can do yourself a favor and get an upgrade and get a better ground clamp on those machines. But the main thing is to make sure it's grounded to clean, bright metal and not just over hot rolled mill scale. Right. And to carry on with that, and again, I did set you up with that question because I knew you, you've addressed that quite a bit is, uh, what, along with troubleshooting on this is to look inside your jaws on your ground clamp uh, because, you know, a lot of people, if you don't believe us or if you don't, if you're having problems like this down the road or your buddy that's working in the booth beside you, you know, as you're troubleshooting, open it up and look inside of there and you will see those arc marks. Uh, I, I've talked to several people. I was like, no, 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 that can't be it. Well, what's inside your ground ca- clamp look like? Assuming it's mainly showing, well, I guess it's showing up in anything, any ground clamp really. But you can really see it in the in the copper brass ones. 
Uh, you can see where it's arced out on the side or in inside the teeth and whatnot, and you know you've got a terrible ground. And you, you, you like you said, you need to need to address that. The other thing that you know goes along with that once that's settled is too much wire feed speed, where you're not actually giving it time to melt and it's just bouncing itself back. That can be another problem. Again, it could be a lot of different things, really. Uh, along with that, you could reverse that and say not enough voltage. Uh, but anyways. Yeah, th- those things definitely are so, you know, related, wire feed speed and voltage. So, you know, either not, either you don't have enough voltage or you got too much wire feed speed. And if you look on, like most machines today, I, I all the legacy machines, Miller, Lincoln, Esob, Hobart, you flip up the lid where the wire spool goes on. You, you, I don't know of any of them that don't have a chart these days, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And it's smart on their part to put that chart in there because it probably probably cuts down on their customer support calls by 50% at least, you know. But the charts are usually a little high on the wire feed speed, and that's probably just to, you know, get as much as much amperage as possible out of the arc when they're rating it. If they rate that machine for a single pass, five sixteenths fillet or whatever, they're going to give you a little bit high on the wire feed speed sometimes, but it's going to get you in the ballpark. So yeah, you know, if you set the machine, just like the machine says, and you light up and it's acting a fool sputtering and stubbing and you know, all that, then check that ground. And if the ground's fine and it's still doing that, then you need to look further. <laughs> it could be your drive rollers. You know, they need to be sized right. They need to be the right size, the right type groove. They need to be either smooth or knurled, depending on if you're using, a, you know, hard wire or or aluminum or flux core wire. You know, the knurled, you, you know, the smooth grooved rollers are usually for for hard wire. But you you, you got to have the right size. And if they're slipping, they're going to give you problems. If your liner is dirty and or kinked, it's going to give you problems. There's a whole plethora of stuff that can give you problems with the MIG process. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, along with the grounded issues, keep an eye on the actual connection from the, the of the cable itself to the ground because that seems to be another popular problem. Over time, your cable or the the wire will naturally pull out of the the ground. Unless you depends well depends on what connection you got, but if it starts to slip out, you got more resistance right there because you've got less cable attached to the ground, and usually you'll see those grounds, you know, especially the cable start to burn, turn red. Uh, you run into problems when you're actually welding on the actual gun side, and it's like, what's going on here? And you find out that it's your ground cable. Here you don't have a good connection. You got a ton of resistance in there that shouldn't be there in the first place. So snip it back, put it back together right, and you know go about your business. I've seen a lot of places that uh, you go in there and it's like uh, you might want to get that fixed because you know you're just creating more problems and not actually getting the uh, the current that you think you're getting at the tip. Yeah, that was actually something I was going to bring up. Same thing. I've seen that at many places I've worked where you're like. Ugh. That thing's fraying out like crazy. You might want to take the time and cut that off and redo that. But another thing, too, is the spring on the clamps will go bad over time, too. And, you know, mm-hmm. if, if you got a loosey-goosey spring and it just barely is hanging on your table, eh, you might want to see if they can order you a new spring. Yeah. There are a lot of options for ground clamps out there to upgrade your clamp. I mean, the standard old cast brass clamp with a strong spring nothing wrong with that not going to diss that at all but there are other options like there are even ones that have the vice grip type uh you know set up to clamp really get a super super rigid grip on something with a uh a solid copper uh ring with ridges in that vice grip setup you know Mm -hmm. and all kinds of things and miller used to have i don't know if they do anymore they had a really nice ground clamp it was a you know regular old uh steel zinc plated frame on the ground clamp but the jaws were were copper alloy and they had all kind of little dimples on the jaws themselves so you had all these all these little contact points with a nice strong spring i really love that one bragged on it but must have cost them a dollar too much or something i don't know you know yeah over time too you know with as as the ground clamp arcs out you're going to have connection issues there too you know we 
as our, part of our maintenance program, I guess not really part of the maintenance, I guess we just do it because, you know, we do. But, you know, as we go and check our connections th- when, during our schedule, we'll take and sand on the inside, uh, either file or sand, depending on what it is, and get rid of all those arc marks out of there because, you know, again, they're just, you, you have a spot that's not getting the ground or a potential that's not, you know, working quite right. Um, I, I was thinking of this too, you know, along with grounds, you know, they have the kind, I like them, but they don't, they don't work for everything. The kind that has like the screw on it where you can tighten it down onto something. You, you, you've seen those, haven't you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was watching a guy weld at, I mean, a good 350, 400 amps and the machine was sitting, it was probably 15, 20 feet from away and they had the ground frayed. I mean, it was falling out and whatnot. They got that thing so hot that we had trouble. You know, we, we, we saw it, and I'm like, "Hey, we, we need to we need to stop here. We got a problem. The, the ground was smoking and everything. It got us so hot that that actually seized the threads in there because it's brass too. And it's like, Ugh, you got a problem here, man. <laughs> but you know, you don't always see that when you're welding. Again, the farther away you go, the more resistance you got in that, and it just creates problems on its own there too. But anyways, we we've camped out on on grounding issues there. What about actual MIG? Um, the other thing I can think of is consumable problems to where, you know, you're going through tips, uh, contact tips at the end of your diffuser there. I mean, what would be something you, things you guys would recommend if you're, if you're, let, let's give a scenario there for aluminum because aluminum, aluminum comes up uh, as a topic of, Hey, why is my tips burning back on me or the wire burning back and it's ruining my tips? You'll oftentimes hear people say, like spool guns, you know, one of the hatred things for spool guns is a lot of people say they're finicky. Um, I think they're all right if you if you're setting them right and you're using them properly. But you know they often say that spool guns burn through the tips, and a lot of times it comes back to actually most of the time it comes back to either not enough wire feed speed, too close to contact to work distance, or on the flip side of not enough wire feed speed, too much voltage. Um, what do you guys take on contact tips? I know you're you're not a MIG welder, Roy, but you know you can still weigh in. <laughs> <laughs> I weigh about one sixty five, <laughs> one seventy. Uh, oh man, you know that is, golly, you could talk you could talk an hour on that. I think, and I certainly don't know everything about it, but I know what I have experienced anyway, and I'll definitely go along with the not enough wire speed thing. Uh, I always recommend that you start off if you're if you're kind of new on a spool gun, you start off on the higher range of whatever the recommended. Like like I always recommend when I was doing classes and stuff, I'm so all right. Look up the Miller Weld Calculator. It's an app, even you know I've got it on my phone, but look that up on online. All right, go to aluminum. All right, what does it tell you to set it at? All right, add add just a little bit to the wire feed speed. Mm-hmm. Light up, it would work, and you wouldn't blow a tip. You know. Now let's trim it back a little bit. You know, whereas if you if you lit up at the bottom of that range, you might blow a tip. You know, it would it would weld great for five seconds and then it would arc back to the tip because you're trying to get in that in that nice smooth spray transfer on aluminum, and it's kind of like if you wanna if you don't want to change tips, yeah, you have to cheat a little bit and maybe not have it quite so smooth of a spray <laughs> transfer. You know, sometimes. Yeah have a little more wire feed speed than what the optimum is for a nice smooth spray because uh man uh, w- once it's really humming on spray it kind of sometimes is you can kind of see it like one to inch back into your, into your right. tip you know so and it depends on the machine it depends on a lot of things you know the uh i don't know how much inductance comes into play on spray transfer or anything like that, but I know one machine is different than the other as far as the, what, how likely it is to burn the tip back, you know. And I have guys talk about, yeah, once I get it dialed in, I can go, I can use a tip for a whole day of just constant welding, you know. And that's awesome, you know, if you can. Right. But other guys are like, I'm going through like ten tips a day, you know. Yeah, actually, it was when I rented. Uh, I don't, have, I don't have a spool gun from my Miller 252, but I rented one. I don't know a few months ago to do a project. And once I got it set up, it was it was fine. I burned a tip up every time a spool ran out. But you know, <laughs> if you don't know what's going to end, it's kind of is what it is. Mm-hmm. But you know, other than that, it seems to last quite a bit of time. 
One thing I wanted to throw out there for, and this goes for for steel, for flux core. You can go for even go for flux core. Steel and aluminum mainly what we're I'm, I'm envisioning right here because I'm not you know super super experienced in the dual shield flux core world. Uh, I, I've run my share of it, but I've not ran a ton ton. But you know, keep in mind that the more wire feed speed, and again, this is this is just a general statement. The more wire feed speed you have, you're going to keep that arc cone closer to the base metal. The less amount you're going to bring that arc cone back. You know, if you, if you have let's just say 500 inches a minute on aluminum, and that arc cone is going to be closer to your contact tip, so you know, 500 inches a minute, your voltage is higher at a given voltage, and 700 inches a minute. You know, that arc cone is going to be pushed away. That's kind of what I try to tell people when they're running, especially spool guns um, and, and spray transfer and pulse on uh, hard wires, is you want to keep the arc cone, for the most part anyway, you want to keep the arc cone away from your contact tip and maintain the proper contact to work distance because uh, that can kill you right there. Getting closer right there, you burn up a tip and burn up a nozzle. And, I mean, even people burn up diffusers. Like, how do you burn up a diffuser? You know, <laughs> what was you doing, know. you know? <laughs> I know. I can be done. I I talked to a guy a while back, and he said, uh, "I forget exactly." He's I, he was telling me he went through a couple diffusers in a week, or I think it was a week or a day. I'm like, dude, a diffuser should last you a good, good long time. What are you doing? And so we went through the process of going through what was wrong, why was it set up that way, you know, what happened so that you're ruining all the way back to a diffuser, getting the gun way, way super hot, exceeding its duty cycle, whatever you're doing, you know, you're doing something wrong when you're doing that. You know, when your nozzle's turning cherry red, there's a problem. <laughs> yeah, really, really. You know, that brings me to, th- I'm thinking about uh, some of the tapered contact tips as well. And, uh, the, you know, the life on those seems to be less, and it makes sense because they're, there's less mass there, you know. They get hotter. Right. And they have their place, like if you're doing, especially on steel, if you're doing a open route or something in, in a tight bevel, you know, you need a, a fairly small nozzle, and, and you don't want your contact tip clogging up your whole nozzle, so you use a tapered contact tip, you know, so your gas flow is right. But, you know, they get hot, really. They get really hot. You can A lot of times you can tell if you run stainless, you know. thing runs good for about five seconds, and then it starts you have feeding problems and it's just, it's like dragging through the tip because it's, the tip is so hot, you know, stuff like that happens. So you gotta, you gotta be, uh, it's all boils, you know, comes back around to troubleshooting. Like start, start thinking about what's going wrong and, uh, why am I having feeding problems and why is it good for 10 seconds? And then it has feeding problems and, mm-hmm. you know, that, that could lead, lead you to think about, well, I'm going to change out tips cause it's, when that contact tip starts getting hot, that's when I start having feeding problems, you know, right? things like that. You just really yep. got to be a thinking man to dial in on some of these things. Yep. That's another common problem. You know, I've, I mean, it happens to me, it happens to all, everybody, honestly, eventually when you're welded, you're going to feel like your gun has turned to a machine gun. It's like spitting on you and it's got a little bit of resistance. Sometimes you can see it in the puddle where it kind of looks like a globular transfer to where it's not a smooth arc cone right there. You can see the droplets going in there all of a sudden. It's like, you know, sometimes you can feel it in the gun. But, you know, you can generally see that. Typically, not always, but typically that's your contact tip going bad. Sometimes it could be the liner going bad. Sometimes it could be, you know, feeding issue at, at the machine. But typically it's the contact tip. And, you know, obviously at that point you either need to let the contact tip cool down or switch it out and go about, about the rat killing. But I have actually switched to the majority of my contact tips are now uh, a mix. They're not pure copper or, or whatever the standard actually is. Um, they're a mix, and they have other components in there, and they last a whole lot longer than the regular contact tips, regular ones you just buy at, at the store. They're a lot more expensive, but they definitely last long, longer. Um, but just just to throwing that out there for those that you know might be running into the problem of Hey, I'm burning a contact tip up every four hours. Maybe you can switch to another contact tip, and you can get a day, two days out of it. Switch to a water-cooled gun, you might be able to get a week out of it or two weeks, depending on how much you're actually welding. So again, you know, troubleshooting on MIG welding is is a lot. <laughs> yeah, and and what you're saying to me, it drives the point home. Like, it, you know, like you, does the guy in his garage? thinking he's you know does he think he needs to get a water-cooled gun probably not but mm-hmm. we're talking about 
if you're talking about a, you know a production type job where you're running two inch fillet welds it takes 200 passes to get that in there you know now you're, you're going to go through some tips and now all of a sudden you're you're paying somebody whatever 20 30 bucks an hour to stop and change tips and all that and, and the downtime and and the aggravation and all that and so maybe it's well worth it to spend extra on a different alloy contact tip or a water cool gun or whatever just to keep that downtime out of the equation sometimes that's well worth it to do that i remember i remember uh one of the very first aws section meetings i went to there was a welding engineer there and i think i've told the story already so you know i'm getting old so you have to give me a pass on some of this stuff <laughs> <laughs> but he was uh he worked for weld services which is a outfit near atlanta here and they do a lot of work in nuclear plants and, and some of the work that they do is on boiler tubes and they do the cladding of Inconel 625. So they set up carriages like bug guns, you know, and they run downhill runs um, on carbon steel boiler tubes, but they're cladding it with Inconel 625, and that extends the life of the boiler. I'm, I'm oversimplifying this, but that's the gist of it. So they stack bead after bead after bead, and this guy was saying they were, you know, one of the operators was just kept, kept cranking the, the tensioners or the wire feed speed, that is, up, up, and up to get a good bead, and it, it kept causing him downtime. And finally, he said, as a as an engineer, I wrote in the process, change the liner after every spool of wire. Well, a, a spool of Inconel 625 is probably thousands of dollars, you know. Yeah, a spool yeah. of ER70 might be 50 bucks, you know. But a spool of Inconel 625 being a nickel alloy, it's a ton of money. And the $15, $20 liner in the, in the 10 minutes it took to change it out was chump change compared to anything else. So I just bring that up to say it just all depends on the application. Like how much is at risk? How much are you paying your employees? Or if you're just in your garage doing an occasional repair, your liner might last you, you know, your lifetime. But on a job like that where they're running hundreds and hundreds of pounds of Inconel 625 through a liner and in the job, it was a multi-million dollar job. It made sense to change the liner every spool of wire. So mm -hmm. it, it's just different. It just depends on what's at risk, you know, the, the cost of the job, whether or not it's industrial versus just personal use in your garage, that kind of thing. Yeah. I've even seen uh, the life expectancy of your drive rolls every year, um, or it was a year or two years for a place. They replace the uh, drive rolls. Because they wear, it's like really never would have. I mean, I'm sure there's somewhere, but it's probably not. It depends on who you are, you know. Once again, but anyways, yeah, you do have to kind of keep track of it. Like I, I don't. I mean, I've got 15, 20 welding machines, you know, and each one of them gets a few hours here and there. So I'm not worried about my dry rollers, right? But, that's, but somebody that's... like maybe JD, who is running, you know, he's running tons of dual shield through some of his machines. He probably needs to maybe keep an eye on that, you know? Right. That and his liner with that, you know. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and again, the liners, you know, I, I've, I've mentioned it before. We typically, I mean, we've been slower here lately, but anyways, typically when we're busy and we're running, we replace our liners and our machines every week as part of our, our program, our maintenance program, because of, again, we don't want to mess up, so we don't want the problems. Um, but, you know, that might change if we was running dual show flux core all the time. You know, that could be a little bit more dirty. Um, and again, there's other ways to, to clean it up, and there's theories on whether you should or shouldn't so far as scrubbing the wires, scrubbing actually in any wire, really. There's theories both ways. But anyways, it goes back to the troubleshooting you know, of the resistance in the gun. You know, you feel, feel that resistance, there's, there's a problem, so stop. I've seen a lot of guys that try, and I do it too if I'm getting close to the end, end of a run and it starts messing up my contact tip. I generally know it's the contact tip. That it's just it just had it, um, you know. I'll I'll try to make it to the end, but there are some guys that I'm sure that just keep going and going and going, and the weld looks terrible. You can tell when a contact tip is getting messed up and getting held up. Um, the weld does not look smooth. Of course, I guess it depends on how much you're whipping. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe again, I'll bring it back to the disposable razor analogy. You know, I mean, they're like what fifty cents a piece, maybe. Um, for a contact tip, maybe closer to a buck, but you know, it comes a point at which it's not worth the savings to suffer the discomfort, <laughs> you know, and, right. uh, you know, I, I, I don't try to get the last 
few seconds out of a contact tip. I don't change them every every day or anything like that either. But I don't. I'm not. A, I'm not a production shop either. But I notice right. there's. You know, I there, there starts a there, there's a point at which you can even look at it and you're like, wow, that's there's a lot of slop in that hole as compared to the wire coming out of it. It's like like a you know egg shaped hole and then it's just and you know if you can see that much slop in there, that's you, you really need to change it definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I like talking about the the MIG side of things. There's, um, yeah. you're making me think of all kinds of things, but we better. There's a lot of memories. Something that come else. Up. I'm a, let me bring one more thing up before we get off a of MIG. Um, there was a station at in a little fabrication station where I used to work, and they had a a, a Millermatic 250. Okay, and so it would sit there for months without being used. Sometimes, but then they, somebody would need to use it and build a little frame or whatever, you know. And they it, invariably, and I noticed this because it was set out right outside the training area. It wasn't our machine, but it sat right next to our training area. And somebody would be like, hey, why why won't this thing run good? Because it hadn't, hadn't been running months, and they lit up on it. And it was always, you know, we 7525, C25 gas, and it would it would run like crap. And that brings me to the, to the idea of, have you ever seen people, uh, or especially old-timers, talking about rolling a bottle on the floor to mix up the gas to it, mm-hmm. that, that stratifies after a certain period of time? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, and and there you know you can read articles about that, and they tell you, uh, theoretically, it can't possibly happen unless it's in the... Well, it obviously happened because somebody new would come over there, and they'd run it, and it wouldn't run good, it wouldn't run good, and nobody changed anything. And after they just welded with it for a while, it would finally weld okay. <laughs> it would finally find its own level you know and so we started kind of kind of experimenting and and taking that bottle off the machine and and rolling it on the floor and then it would it would weld good you know right away then so there is something to that uh that stratification of gases just from something sitting dormant for a long time you know so think about that everybody out there because i mean i know there's a lot of people that have stations in their garage and they don't weld for nine months and then all of a sudden they need to go weld it might do you well to remove your tank, roll it around on the floor a little while, and then put it up, you know, before you start welding, because you're talking about argon and CO2, and uh, you know, if you're not getting the right mixture, it's, it's going to be a big difference in the way it welds. It might settle down after a while, but why go through all that pain? Just mix it up a little bit by rolling it on the floor first. Right, and there's a lot of people that don't believe that, and uh, it is absolutely true. I've seen some reports on it. I've even heard some background things about uh, stratification of the gases, and it's definitely true. Uh, But, you know, actually, they recommend, and I'll probably get flamed for this, they recommend (laughs) that a a gas cylinder only be sitting, I think, for six months. Now, again, I don't know if the – I can't remember the actual time period, but I think it's six months and after that, you're supposed to just you know give it back or whatever you're supposed to do. But you can roll it around. You can do different things to, you know, get it back together. But there are uh, I've read different reports. I've seen it myself to do it for different projects. I'm um, like, really? I got to roll my cylinder. I got to disconnect it, roll it around. <laughs> uh, but it is true. And sometimes you're glad you did. And I don't know, you know, like I said, sometimes science and reality don't quite meet you know you got it there's something there's a missing link somewhere then all the, the the theories don't match the application you know and 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 so i'm all about hey i want this thing to work you know i don't care what the theory says i want this thing to weld good you know and right. uh you have a hundred phds tell me i don't need to roll my tank but if i roll my tank for five minutes and it welds 100 percent better you know then i my my opinion of phds remains the same <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy! <laughs> now we've got ourselves in trouble. <laughs> Sorry, Joel. <laughs> yeah, for first, first I thought of too. <laughs> you're just almost a PhD, so it doesn't it doesn't apply to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you guys want to move on to stick then, real quick. I mean, we're, yeah, let's we're do running that. out of time. For I got today, a, but I've got a scenario really quick for sure. Mig. Um, this might help some of the new guys out there. So you're welding along, and you come to the end, and you stop. You pull away, and all of a sudden, this volcano comes out of the end of your weld. What's going on? <laughs> Sometimes it's that it's that uh, pressurized effect that you get with TIG when something blows out on you. Like if you're if you got a really tight miter fit on a 
on square tubing and you're sewing it up and you stop, uh, sometimes it's that effect where it's pressure built up inside kind of blowing it out. I know exactly what you're talking about, though. I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> and I haven't ever really, I've never really dug into it deep enough to find out exactly what it always is, but I have had that effect happen before. Like, like, um, I have this uh, evolution, uh, dry, dry cut saw with a carbide tip blade, and it's pretty darn precise. So, you know, you can make a square tubing rectangular frame if you're building a whatever, let's just say welding cart, for instance. You cut 45 miters, you get everything tacked up. There's no gaps at all. And so, um, you'll see it on something like that when you're welding it with MIG. You stop and it's just like a, you know, it, it, like a little nipple pops up on your crater, you know. And I'm thinking that's what it is. It's just pressure building up inside, but, um, there could be, there could be another explanation for that. Not sure. Add to what you said. It can definitely be pressure build up uh, like a fillet weld. Let's say you're putting two pieces of metal together, like you said. Definitely that can be the problem. But specifically, I think you're asking it, it at the end of the weld, right, Roy? I yeah. mean, not like in the middle or anything like that. One of the things that it can be, again, it can be many different things also, is a lack of shielding gas while welding or and or – and more, I lean more toward this also, is a lack of uh, post flow. You wouldn't think that MIG would need a post flow. And there's a lot of machines out there that won't have that option out there, like little, little 110 welders and whatnot. But I have noticed that with high amperage spray transfer, uh, both in pulse and, and uh, spray, regular spray, that if you don't have like two tenths of a, of a post flow, that sometimes that it will get that little volcano nasty look effect. Um, but it can be a variation of things. It could be improper gun angle to where you lose your shielding at the end. Um, but I think that a, a good more amount of it goes back to shielding gas coverage. Do you have an answer, Roy? Or No, I, I was kind of curious because I, I remember, oh. I mean, it, it may go back to gun angle and stuff because I remember that happening when I was first starting. And as I got better at MIG, it just kind of stopped. You know, right. so it might have been, you know, I was pulling away too quick or, you know, like you're saying, having the gun angle too steep or something at the end, you know, when you're getting uncomfortable, you're just trying to make it to the end and right. something. But it was weird, you know, like you'd flip your hood up and you could just watch it growing out of the puddle. It's like, huh, that's weird. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Grind that off. Yeah. And where'd that you come know, from? <laughs> but it, now that you guys say that, yeah. I have, yeah, I agree because I have seen it happen when you make a short run, when you, and you forget to turn your gas on, but you still have gas like in your pressurized in your in your line, but you either forget to turn it on or you're running out or something, and you're maybe you maybe you run an inch or a half inch or an inch. I, I now that you mentioned, I do recall seeing it a lot in that scenario. So it is shielding gas related, probably post flow, and again, it can be the pressurized uh, you know inside of a tight fit up that's doing that too but um more than likely it's it's a shielding gas issue right and i, I want to i'll throw this out there too so i don't get flamed for this because people are like post flow on mig were you crazy well i think it also depends on how thick the material is you're welding how fast the weld pool solidifies and or how much amperage you're running i mean there's there's a lot of variables that go back to this but you know, if I was going to give it one answer, it would be you know the lack of shielding. You know, of somehow, some way, you're doing something wrong, and it's not maintaining shielding coverage at the end and growing that little volcano thing. So right along with that, I took pictures of this. Uh, it's probably been a year, two years, and I think it's still in the cloud. Never shared it. Kind of one of them things that I wanted to see what other people thought of. Uh, I'm not saying that I have the answer to this. I think I know, but it goes right along with what you're saying, Roy. So I was welding a three-inch plate weldment, and it was like one inch or something like that, fillet welds. And see, I got close to the end of my passes. Now, I'd already had root passes down, uh, not, I guess I'd say root passes, probably like three, four, six passes underneath. And I'm welding along about 350 amps. Actually, that was probably closer to 400 amps. One sixteenth, I think it was. Uh, solid wire, and I welded along, and all of a sudden it just goes boom, blows up right at my gun, and I stopped. Of course, scared the daylights out of me. Um, got past it probably an inch, and when I stopped, it looked like somebody took and drilled a hole all the way to the root, 
all the way down. I'm like, that is just weird. You wouldn't think that it would have trapped gas inside of there and blew out after you've got six welds in there. But again, that weld is penetrating in there. Um, I guess I'm throwing it out there because it can happen when you trap, you know, the, the gases in there and it keeps building up, building up, building up, especially at that high amperage. A uh, one sixteenth wire, um, you know, will penetrate pretty deep actually. And uh, so what do you guys think of, about something like, have you ever seen that? I guess is what I'm getting at as well. It's not like it's unusual and it's not common, but the way that it, that, that it happened this time, it's like normally it like blows up and looks terrible, but this was like just a solid hole all the way or an open hole, not a solid hole, open hole all the way down to the bottom. Like that's weird. I've seen similar stuff happen. Maybe not exactly that, but I can kind of wrap my head around it. You know, if you think about you, you have a gas pocket, maybe it's a 16th of an inch in diameter on a, on a pass. And then you weld over top of it and then maybe, maybe nothing happened. And then you weld over top of it again. And for some reason, the pressure built inside that little, tiny pour and it got hot enough and the metal was hot enough around it and it just blew all the way up through two or three passes all the way up through the current pass you know Mm -hmm. just like uh it had enough pressure and force behind it to just find a way to escape you know yeah i mean that's the other thought too somehow some way when i was making a pass that i trapped somehow something somehow and it blew up. I, I'll have, now I'm going to have to post these things on Instagram because everybody's going to be like, well, I want to see the pictures. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing about porosity, you know, and that's why sometimes you, you got to grind and grind and grind and grind to get to the root of it. And if you don't get to the root of it, you, you, you know, <laughs> it's going oh, to rear its ugly head anyway. So you got to keep going, you know. But um, yeah, that's say, the, that, that one sucked to grind out. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it did. Hmm. I bet it did. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we can move on then to stick. That was a good, uh, a good little thing because I, in my mind's eye, I can remember that happening. I know it's happened to the, every, every dude that's out there MIG welding. You know, every dude and gal as well. You know, that's something that happens pretty frequently. That little volcano at the end. Mm-hmm. But okay, stick welding. I'm gonna go ahead and say porosity is probably one of the, one of the main things. You know, um. At least in my experience, you know, especially like 7018 pipe welding, you know, um, you get an X-ray failed on account of porosity. Nine times out of ten, if it's pipe, it's on. It's at six o'clock on the bottom. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, what causes what causes porosity in stick welding? Well, let me just say right now that if you have 7018 and you drop it in the mud, make sure that you rinse that off before you <laughs> weld. <laughs> yeah. Just to make gonna, sure that you get all the mud off and then you're good to go. There you go. <laughs> I saw that on Instagram somewhere. Make sure, <laughs> yeah. Make sure that if you stir your chicken noodle soup with a 7018, make sure. <laughs> <laughs> it, it makes it yeah. smell better. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, even with a six, uh, 7018, let's just, let's just cover some groundwork here in case somebody's just not, not up to speed. A 7018 is, also known as a low hydrogen rod, you know, referred to as a low high rod, low hydrogen. And, and, that, and it's low hydrogen. Hydrogen is a really small molecule, and it can permeate into steel and, you know, kind of bury itself. And then as it's trying to find its way back out, it can actually cause cracking. So you don't want hydrogen. Engineers don't want hydrogen in, in anything important. So structural welding, heavy thick wall pipe welding and all that, low hydrogen rods are used a lot. If you're a student, if you're looking to make a living as a welder, you need to learn all about low hydrogen rods and you need to get good at them because that's going to be your bread and butter on a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So low hydrogen rods typically are kept in a rod oven right up to the point of use sometimes. Sometimes you've got a big rod oven in your shop, but other times you've got a portable rod caddy it might only hold 10 pounds of rods, but it's, you know, you keep it plugged in and you get one rod at a time out of that thing. And it's the rods so hot that it'll burn your fingers if you touch it. It's that the reason is to keep the hydrogen out of it. So you can still, though, you can still get porosity in a, in a low hydrogen rod that's right out of the oven. You know, a lot of times it comes from when you're starting a bead, you know, maybe you hold a too long an arc for too long a time. 
maybe you got a fan blowing on your weld because it was typical in my memory. And even though this was, even though this was a long time ago, this is back in the mid eighties, you know, welding a whole lot of low hydrogen rod, uh, electric fan was standard issue every day at work because you just, you had to keep cool. It was a hundred degrees, you know, on the job and you wanted to blow the well fume out of, out of your, uh, breathing zone. So you'd have a fan running. Well, you can stick weld with a fan running. That's the benefit of stick welding and a little wind doesn't necessarily hurt anything. But if you got too much fan running, you can, you can get some porosity, you know, so that can be a cause. It can be, like you said, you dropped it in the mud. Maybe, you, maybe it did, didn't come right out of that, out of the rod oven. Maybe you didn't plug your rod oven in that you're supposed to have plugged in on the, right up to the time you use your rod, you know? It could be a rod that, uh, has got the flux chipped off of it for the first half inch or anything, any, any of the above can cause porosity, but, um, porosity is a common thing with stick rod, you know, especially 7018, 6010. It can happen. And so you, you kind of got to learn to watch for it and learn to create the kind of habits that don't promote the possibility of porosity. And some of those things are things I just mentioned, you know, keeping your rod in a rod oven, not having too much breeze on you when you're welding, don't have too long of an arc for too long a time. Like when you start off on the bottom of a pipe, you ha- you kind of have to long arc for a second or so while you're kind of getting your bearings on where you're going to, you know, tie into your previous bead or whatever. And uh, that's common practice, but you got to figure it out what will not give you porosity and what will. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head, though, with the, uh, you know, porosity is, maybe I should say most common, but very common with lighting up. And you've got some videos out there showing um, the technique of lighting up ahead of where you're welding and then welding into where you struck. That'll help eliminate porosity. I um, mean, you're right. P- pipe. I'm not. Yeah, you know, I'm not a pipe welder, but you know the tests that I take. Some of them, you know, the, you go to practice some, and it's like, man, you go light up, and it's just there's no in a good place to light up. You get porosity there, and it's like, well, that one ain't going to the lab, you know. Um, the problem there. Um, another problem that I've seen as well is uh, old electrodes, and they have rust underneath the flux, um, you know, because they permeated, been sitting forever, so they permeate all the moisture out of the atmosphere. That can cause problems um, as well. But, there, you know, there's a lot of you probably listening that don't have a rod oven. I don't have a rod oven. I got a homemade little doodad with a light bulb type of a thing, but, you know, it doesn't even get it up above uh, AWS's requirements for the rod oven anyway. But, you know, it's better than nothing. That's what I think anyway. I have heard the theory also. I'm not saying to do this. I've seen – I have seen it done. Some old timers that uh, that been around for quite a while doing this, they will actually take their 7018 electrodes and heat them up with a torch. And I, I was like, doesn't that like impregnate carbon and all kinds of other stuff in? And oh no, that's good. Okay, whatever works, man. You know, it seems to work. I'm not saying it don't work. I'm just saying I've seen it done. I'm not saying it's acceptable or approved by <laughs> anybody whatsoever. Um, another thing that I is probably the most frustrating thing besides grinding out your porosity is arc blow. You know, if you've been stick welding long enough, at some point in time, you're going to experience arc blow. And so what that is, is it mainly shows its head in groove welds and fillet welds mainly, but mainly groove welds, especially when you're doing like a one inch groove weld, you get close, you light up at the bottom, you say you're doing a 3G vertical up. And you, you start lighting up at the bottom, you go up, and as you get like two inches from the top, it could be, you know, two inches, three inches, an inch, you'll see the arc just start to blow away from you. And usually it's blowing in the opposite direction if you're traveling. No matter what you do, it seems like it's like, what's going on here? And it's what they call arc blow. And what that is, is it's the electrical current actually coming back at you. Or I'm, I'm trying to think of an easy explanation anyway. As it's going through, as the current and everything's going through the metal, it's actually coming back at you. And the electromagnetic fields are blowing back at your arc. And it's what we commonly refer to as arc blow. Is that a good explanation, Jody? Pretty good. Pretty good. It, it's, um, you know, I, I'm no expert at it. I just know I fight with it all the time like everybody else does, you know. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's it's kind of like uh like Jonathan just said. Let's say you got a 7-inch long coupon, you light up at the bottom, everything is lovely. You think, "Oh, I'm I'm jamming because this is going in great." And then at some point like that last rod, you didn't change anything. The last rod 
toward the top of the of the coupon, like a vertical up 3G uh, groove weld, things just act start acting funny. Like the bar rod starts burning off unevenly, mm. and you you want to fight it by really holding a tight arc and jamming it in there, and that does help, but it doesn't like completely do the trick so then when you get finished with the weld that last inch or two looks a little different you might have a little undercut you might you might wonder if it went in okay that's arc blow because there's magnetic forces that set up as you go along it's very it's a very complicated thing i can't in any way but you know as you go along magnetic forces set up depending on where you have your ground attached and uh it makes a difference in the way the rod burns interesting i actually bought a pair of uh, heavy duty jumper cables recently. And I'm, meaning, I'm intending to do a video on this to try to show if that helps. But I was going to think about, I was thinking about attaching, you know, you got four clamps, four jumper cable clamps with a set of jumper cables. I was thinking on a test joint, like attaching two clamps to each side of the piece at the top, two side of the pieces at the bottom. And now you've got all these places for the ground to go through instead of it being directional. And I can't help but think that might help, but I haven't proven it out yet. You know, it, but it might, but wouldn't it still go the path of least resistance? So wouldn't it? Wouldn't it in theory pick one of the four, and that would be where it actually would be pulling the most current from? I'm just thinking out loud now. It might. It might. I, I don't know. I'm just. I'm just totally thinking. I'll do some testing to That'd see if. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, it. it uh, and I've also heard of people. Uh, you know, like you know, um, using runoff tabs on the top and the bottom, and then maybe clamping grounds to both ends. And things like that. But anything, I think anybody would do well to do something to try to mitigate that if they're taking a test. Because right. a lot of things are permitted, you know, like that. Like, oh, I can, you know, where they don't tell you where you have to attach the ground, you know. So maybe you attach it to the top of the plate instead of the bottom. So you're welding to the ground instead of, I don't know. It, it really does take a little, I've never really settled on an answer, like a foolproof answer for eliminating arc blow. But I'm uh, I'm working on it. <laughs> I went yeah. to the effort of buying some heavy duty jumper cables, which really came in handy on um, jumping off my Jeep <laughs> <laughs> recently. But I haven't used them in a video yet. <laughs> well, it'd be interesting to see what you come up with. Typically, well, like I run into it often when I'm going in to train for certification tests. And of course, you know you got guys that are really wanting to pass this test. It usually happens after like the first two fills you know fill uh, passes in there usually but not always and so you get to your third you know when you start to either weave and i mean it depends on what groove you you know it depends on a lot of things how thick your plate is whether you're doing stringers or a weave or whatever but usually it gets to like the third fourth pass in there you start to get arc blow well these guys are taking a real test trying to get a raise or trying to do whatever that is that the company's doing and they start getting arc blow my best suggestion to them has been to put the ground clamp in the center of the plate. Um, but I often wonder, and that seems to help. And then, of course, you got to really jam that rod in there. Sometimes, but not, not always, by doing that and jamming it in there and getting it built up, you know, three or four more layers, sometimes that arc blow goes away. Uh, actually, a lot of times it goes away. Uh, because then you don't have so much of a groove in there. And again, I don't know all the sciences behind it. I'm not a scientist by any means. Don't have that PhD. But I often wonder, honestly, if letting the plate cool back down to close to ambient temperature would help also. If the heat has some effect on you know arc blow at all. I'm not saying it does because it does seem to really rear its head up when you're in a deep groove. Um, it could even be a square groove. It could be, it could be a lot of the J grooves, anything like that, that you're down deep inside of there and you get close to that end and those magnetic forces really get you. It, what's funny is, is you can cut, you know, a dozen coupons from the same bar and you'll know, get so frustrated at the plate you're welding with because of arc blow. So you're just like, well, just go, go tack another one up and let's, you know, usually the guys I'm doing, working with, we have two plates. So if something happens to the first one, they could immediately jump onto the second one and, you know, try to catch back up kind of a thing. So it's like, well, just, you know, forfeit this one and let's start another one. And it's amazing how many times arc blow just instantly disappears. And it's like, what is with that particular plate that made arc blow such a problem? You know, and again, I don't have all the answers. I'd be interested to see what happens when you put a ground on both sides of the plate. Again, my theory would be that, you know, as you light up at the bottom, that, 
your currents would be going through the ground closest to the electrode, you know, so that'd be the bottom in that case. And as it goes to the top, would it switch to the top one? I I, I don't know. I'm not a not a wizard when, when it comes to electricity and all that stuff. But just be aware of the arc blow. And, uh, one way to, uh, to, to eliminate that is to switch to AC. Um, that will help, but that's not always a, an option for everybody that's out there. Um, that all day current, that'll get rid of that. But yeah, until like I can said, say if, you're, is, if your WPS calls for DCEP, you really can't just just switch right. to AC. But I agree completely. I, I used to have guys do the same thing because we were running. This, this brings it to another thing: a Synchro Wave 250, the old Synchro Wave 250s, the analog things with no digital readout. You know, mm-hmm. that was a square wave machine. I would assume that any square wave machine would would be so similar. Those things will run a 7018 on AC like money. You don't have to have an AC 7018 by any stretch. It'll you just switch over to AC. The standard doesn't matter what kind of 7018 you're running. It will run like new money, and you won't have any arc blow. And I don't know why that why that wasn't you know done more, to be honest. Because man, it runs awesome. Hmm, interesting. But you did make a good point. You know, stick to what your procedure um, mm-hmm. says. You know, again. The one, the one I'm thinking of in the top of my head, I mean, the guy got so frustrated with, I mean, we were timed. We had to get it done by a certain amount of time. And he got pretty far away in his plate and hit arc blow. And, you know, I can't touch his electrode, you know, or holder. I can't weld it for him. I can't show him on that plate. I could show him on another plate. But of course, you show him on a different plate and there's no arc blow, right? And so it's like, what do you, how do you show them this? Um, you know, so it's, it's really difficult when you're coming to actually testing and you run into that, but the best advice I can, I can give you on that when you, when you come up with that is just hold that tight arc and shove it in there and try to motor on as best that you can. Um, I'm not sure if it's really troubleshooting, I guess, but I guess we're giving you the answers when it, uh, when you, when you find it. No, I think it is, I think it is troubleshooting. Another thing I've noticed is if you're at the higher end of the amperage range, like a for instance, a one eighth diameter seventy eighteen. If you're going vertical uphill, you tend to get more arc blow if you're if you're hotter. It right. seems like to me, you know, and uh, which is unfortunate because I like to run hot. <laughs> you know, if I'm doing a test, especially especially you think a test. About, yeah, if you think about like running that root pass in a uh, one inch unlimited, you know, twenty two and a half degree bevel, quarter inch gap, back and strap. You really want to punch that root in the face, you know. <laughs> You want to punch it in there. You don't want to just, you know, run barely enough amperage to run a bead up there. But there is a point at which you will get more arc blow the hotter you're at, you know. So, right. Yeah. So that brings me to this, and then we probably should wrap it up, is another thing that everyone's going to fight at some point in time is you're going to be doing a vertical up 7018 weld, and your weld is going to be falling out behind you. What do you do? Do you turn the amperage up? Do you turn it down? And as, a, as an example here, I'll throw out there, you're running 7018, eighth inch at 100 amps vertical up. The plate thickness doesn't necessarily make much of a difference right now. But let's say you're running stringer beads up and at 100 amps and it's falling out behind you. What's wrong? Well, my gut is you got to go hotter. And, Ab- and Absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, 100 amps, I don't know that I would run any, unless I was running something that I wish I had a 332 on, you know, 100 amps might might be something I'd run. But if I'm running, say, like, say, a quarter inch thickness, I'm not at, I'm not at 100 amps, I promise you that. You see, I, I like to, you know, my old uh, shtick is uh, for vertical and overhead, set the machine hot enough to where it won't stick when you hold a tight arc, then hold a tight arc. That's mm-hmm. my that's my best advice, and it, obviously that's oversimplified. There's a lot of things that can come into play other than that, but yeah, um, if you're if you're 100 amps, you're probably you're not able to hold a super tight arc without sticking, and that, that's the reason it's falling out with you. You know, right? I bring that up because it seems to be that especially guys that aren't super experienced. And again, I train a lot of maintenance guys, and you know they're not welding all day long. That's welding is just a tool in their belt. You know, it's not. The same they do every day. But a lot of times the company will have you set up a procedure and make it as broad as you can. And sometimes, or a lot of times, it's 100, 110 amps to 130, 135, 140 amps. Um, you know, so you can qualify that, that size of electrode. 
Well, a lot of guys will start off on the low end of that at 100 amps or 110 amps or whatever. And so they're long arcing, and they're, they're lo- it's a combination of things, actually. They're long arcing it. They've got the wrong electrode angle. They're pointing you know, either straight up, you know, like an extreme angle. Um, they're just performing, you know, having all these problems. And their first reaction is, it's falling out. I need to turn the amperage down. Well, first off, you can't go outside of the limitations of the procedure anyway. And I'll, I'll tell them, look, turn it up 115 to 120, 125 amps, depending on what you're welding. And hold that electrode pretty much as straight on to that play as you can at a tight arc. And that problem will generally go away. But that's generally not the first thing you think of. You think, oh, it's just, you, you think it's too hot, but it's, in fact, you're at the other direction. Turn it up. I always tell everybody that takes a tail, I'll share one of my, it's not a secret, but I'll share a secret of mine. I always tell, if you're going to take a welding test, do not, an eighth inch 718, don't go below 115 amps. At 115 amps, you are at the limit, in my opinion. You can pass a welding test, and I have, but you're at the very low limit, uh, especially if you're not super skilled at it, of passing that welding test. You're 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 not going to punch in quite as much. Uh, I like to stay as close to 120 amps as I can. That's generally, if you ask me to take a test for you, 3G, I'm going to set it at 120 amps and just motor along because I know that you know it's probably good enough that where I can pass the test. But you know, just throwing that out there also for troubleshooting, you know, don't necessarily think that because it's falling out that you have too much amperage. Sometimes that could be the case. If you're trying to do vertical up at 170 amps, you know, eighth inch electrode, you got a problem. Uh, but amperage is your friend in some of those cases. Yeah, I've, I've done a lot of testing. I've got a little some clips on videos of showing – you know, doing nothing different but holding a long arc and a tight arc, you know, at, say, 125 amps vertical up. You hold a long arc, and, man, it ain't it ain't very long for that junk falls out on your feet, you know. Mm-hmm. And the same thing applies, just exactly what you're saying, the same thing applies to overhead with a 7018. You know, if you're too cold on overhead, you're going to, your, your tendency is going to be to long arc it so that your rod won't stick, and then you're going to have all that metal all on you. I've got plenty of scars on my arms from when I was a slow learner in that <laughs> on overhead. And when I finally discovered that, you know, you need to turn it up, not down, now, then then the scars, you know, were no more. I mean, scars right. are scars. They're going to be there. But, you know, I didn't get any more of them. You know, that was really a, a big light bulb moment for me. It's like, you weld, weld overhead just like you weld flat, man. You just got to keep it tight arc. Right. Yeah, because, I mean, the low amperage typically – We'll give you that ropey bead where it's like really high crowned in the center. And again, you, your tendency, for some reason, I don't know why it is in our minds, it seems to be like our natural human tendency. It's like, oh, well, we need to turn it down. Well, you need to turn it up, you know. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's a good That's a good place to stop, ain't it? It is. I think that'll <laughs> work. It's, we, we touched on enough to hopefully help people, maybe make a few people mad at some of our opinions. And <laughs> Nah, I think it's, nah, you know, there's tons that. of stuff we didn't. Like, you know, we could have covered oil-soaked aluminum castings or cast iron and all that, but the the welding, scope of welding is too broad to cover everything. I think we, you know, we hit on plenty of meaty stuff for people to chew on, and that leaves, that leaves room for, you know, troubleshooting part two. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, there we go. Get into more, more details, and I'll throw this out there also, you know, with the troubleshooting uh, topic. You know, we were we were talking about this before we recorded. It's like I can't believe her, her, who said it now, um, but I, I didn't say it. You know that we didn't never did a troubleshooting topic. You know, so far as for the podcast. So if anybody has anything else that we will, you want us to talk about, throw it out there. DM us, email us, whatever, and uh, we'll try to to jump on that topic also. Yep, there's three of us, so you know there's at least a chance we might have something to say about your question. You would hope anyway. Yeah. If not, we'll Google it, and then we'll just read the answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really what we do the whole time. We're just like, oh, you want a back purse? Let's see. We'll yeah. Google that. <laughs> <laughs> well, All guys, right, then, fellas. Well, we would like to once again thank those that are supporting the podcast. This month, we'd like to once again thank Steve Funk, Eric Rupel, Thor Goodmanson, No San Juan, Shane Gunnan, Jacob Elder, Dave Horvath, Scott Silva, and House of Chop. If you would like to support the podcast, head on over to patreon.com forward slash Welding Tips and Tricks Podcast. And if you'd like to reach us here at the podcast with any questions, you can reach us at Podcast at gmail.com 
or if you'd like to leave us a voicemail, our phone number is 915-308-7024. I'm Roy Crum. I'm Jody Collier. And I'm Jonathan Lewis. And that's a wrap. And that's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> There's this show on TV now, and it's like a mom is an intern working in the office with her daughter, and it's like a news, a news show, and they got a little clip of her mom Googling something like, how do I ask my daughter um, if she, the job she's doing is too dangerous without letting her know or hurting her feelings? She's typing this whole freaking <laughs> paragraph into the Google search bar. You know? Nice. <laughs> no, that's uh, hilarious. That's the way a lot of people use it, though. <laughs> yeah. I suppose hey, whatever works. Yeah. yeah. Roy, edit it doesn't that give you the wrong answer. <laughs> okay.